consider yourself a high achiever, smart, driven, highly successful, I am so excited to have you. My name is Julia Arndt and I'm the host of the Stress Podcast. I will help you develop your stress resilience the same way you've developed your workplace superpowers. Learn peak performance tools to thrive at work and in your personal life. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Stress Podcast. I am super excited to record a new podcast episode for the podcast because it feels like it's been a couple of weeks, which it definitely hasn't been a couple of weeks because I was traveling in Europe. And so I'm super excited to sit here with our next podcast guest, and I'm super excited as well to talk with her about National Yoga Awareness Month. So welcome, Roberta Hughes. Hughes. Yes, Hughes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was asking Roberta before we jumped on the recording how it is pronounced and it's still hard for me but um, Roberta I'm so excited to have you it's great to be here thank you for having me of course um, Roberta I always ask um, all of my guests a question um, just to kind of kick it off and to get to know you a little better and the question is tell us where you are located what you've been up to today and what time it is right now So I am in Denver, Colorado in the United States, and it's a little after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And to begin my day, I woke up early. I woke up at 5.30 this morning and I went to Hot Works and I did a workout and then I came home and did my journaling practice, showered and got ready for the day. Very nice. Do you do that every day? I don't do it every day. I do try to go two times a week to Hot Works. And if I don't go to Hot Works, I still get up and do my journaling practice. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Great. So, Roberta, tell us a little bit more about you and what you've been up to over the last few years. I have been in Colorado since 2005. I was raised from kindergarten through high school in Arizona in a very small town, a military town. So, my father Uh, was in the army for 30 years. And my mother is actually Serbian. So um, they raised me and my sister in a small town, a small military town. And then I went to Arizona State University, which was when I was first introduced to yoga. Mm -hmm. And from there, started moving around. My ex-husband was in the Air Force So I too was a military spouse and I had two boys who are now 24 and 19 years old. Wow. Yes. (laughs) You do not look like you are a mom of a 24 and a 19 year old. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, So for the last couple of years, especially since COVID, I've been focused on bringing content, specifically yoga, Pilates and meditation to people through a virtual platform as well as in person. So obviously during quarantine, we went 100% virtual. And now I do a hybrid of the two teaching in studio and teaching live stream classes and creating on demand library content. Mm, Amazing. Okay, so I want to go back to uh, Roberta going to college and you're getting first time exposed to yoga can you can you take us on that journey and what what happened there and how you got into it and maybe what kind of a um life you know you were in like who was Roberta at that time I was 19 years old and I was a freshman in college I had for the first time moved far away from home which was a three-hour drive (laughs) and that felt really far away for me Um, Most of my friends went to a different college, which was only an hour away from home. So I ventured a little further. And that freshman year, I felt like I was trying to discover who I was Mm -hmm. for the first time, being out of high school, being away from my small town. Who really was I? And my identity had been so tied to that small town version of myself that in a bigger city, a big school, there were many times when I felt lost. I wasn't really connected to who I was. I was figuring it out as I went along. And initially I enrolled as a business major in college and 
those courses were so difficult, but we did have to take a one credit PE course and I chose yoga. Mm -hmm. And now as I look back on that, it really was a blessing for many reasons. The first being because those courses were so challenging and my self-esteem was really plummeting because I went from a straight A student in high school to really struggling that first year of college. Um, and this one hour class was an escape from all of that. And I would just feel wonderful during the class. I felt like I understood what I was learning and my body was able to do the work. And when I would walk out of that class, even my friends would say, you just look so peaceful. You look so relaxed. You look so happy. And that's how I would feel every time I finished. Wow. Amazing. And had you heard about yoga before that you consciously made that decision to take yoga or was it more like a, I don't know what yoga is, but I'm going to try it kind of a thing. I had heard about it, but I had never thought about trying it. And I knew I didn't want to do the other forms of PE that were available. <laughs> I was a cheerleader, a dancer, a gymnast, and most of the PE courses were contact sports or running and none of those appealed to me at all mm -hmm. so it was really by a matter of elimination that I thought well I love gymnastics I love moving my body so let's try this yoga thing mm -hmm. cool and so you know since it's national yoga awareness month which I love so much because I for people that have been listening to my podcast they know I'm a huge uh, yoga aficionado as well I have 400 hours of yoga teacher training as well um, so I'm really into the yoga practice and not just kind of the obviously the physical piece but also the spiritual piece where do where do we start right because I think I, I yoga came to me very late probably I was like probably 28 or 29 um, when I first started dabbling in yoga um If someone is listening to the podcast today and is totally not into yoga and it's like, I don't really know, yoga is not for me, I don't really like stretching <laughs> or, or what people mostly say is I am not flexible at all. So why would I go to yoga? Um, how do you bring people into understanding yoga better and how can we do that today in the podcast? I find that so many people are terrified to start a yoga practice because mm -hmm. of that lack of confidence in how their bodies will behave and how their bodies mm -hmm. will feel. I think a lot of people get competitive when they think mm -hmm. about yoga and they compare themselves to others or to pictures that they've seen. So step number one is to let go of all of the things that you've told yourself about what yoga is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yoga is really the union of the mind, body, and spirit, and the breath is a catalyst in that. So being willing to just find your breath and move your body however you're able to move right now in this moment is a celebration. And to have the confidence and the courage to take that first step and mm -hmm. not be afraid. And I always tell people, if you have one bad experience, try again, because There are many yoga teachers out there who teach in many different ways, and yeah. not every teacher is for every student. And as a student looking, it can be intimidating. What I love to do is have conversations with people and ask them, what is it that you're looking for? What do we need to know about your body? And then make recommendations on the types of practices to begin with so that they mm -hmm. do feel more supported and encouraged in that first step. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And it brings me back to my first yoga class that I took, which was actually at Google because I worked for Google for many years and they offered yoga and I had heard a lot about yoga and how, you know, how, how much people liked it and so on. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go to yoga class. And I went to this yoga class and I do remember it actually pretty well because, um, It was a flow yoga class and I went to the teacher and I said, this is the very first time I'm doing this. And he was like, it's totally okay. He's like, you just do whatever you can. And I felt so overwhelmed and so unsupported <laughs> um, because there were like 30 people in the room. It was pretty all cramped in and a lot of people were, you know, really good at what they were doing. And I had no idea. I had no idea how to align myself. And I was really big into just my body in general. I had done uh, personal training and gym instructor certification before 
before all of that. And so I was really aware of my body, um, but my body was not very flexible because I was um, lifting weights at the time. And so I actually remember I left that class. I felt extremely frustrated <laughs> because I was thinking to myself, wow, this was like really unprofessional and he didn't help me align or he didn't give me any tips. And it was way too much of an advanced class. Um, so I think it took me a little while um, to get back into a, trying a second time because of that first experience and not feeling like, you know, it was aligned. And then now I live in Lake Tahoe, California. And that's where I really got into yoga and I came back here, came up here for the first time in 2015 and and went to a yoga class because it was just aligned with kind of this this place here and the magic of Lake Tahoe. And it just almost called to me to, to go back to yoga class. And I remember going to the studio that I was still practicing at today and it was just go coming into the yoga studio made me feel relaxed because you know you have like all of the different kind of yogic smells <laughs> that you sometimes yes. have in a yoga studio and I I feel like my body immediately relaxed into it and I had very very sweet teachers that you know welcomed me with open arms and now I actually think yoga is one of the most accepting mm. practices or sports that you can do because you know, I have so many teachers that say, even if you're sitting on your mat in a, you know, in child's pose for the whole time during this class yes. and you just focus on your breathing, you've done yoga. Yes. Um, and I think it's really powerful to remind people it's really you're starting yoga where you are at and not where anyone else is at. Yes. And I think you mentioned something that's important for people who are new to yoga to know that if you see a class that says vinyasa or flow and you've never taken yoga, that's probably not the best place to begin. Mm -hmm. So the types of classes to look for would be many studios now have beginner classes. Mm -hmm. And if sometimes people are not wanting to be in a beginner class because that just doesn't feel good to them either. They don't want to call themselves out that they don't know what they're doing. Um, yin yoga is usually great for people who are new to yoga, a gentle or restorative yoga class. All mm -hmm. of these will give you some of those alignment um, points that you are looking for in that flow class. Mm -hmm. If you walk into a flow class, it really is designed to keep moving. So it's hard to keep up, even if you are really physically fit yeah. and active. 100%. If you don't know all of the postures, it's kind of like you're just... <laughs> What do I do next? What do I do mm -hmm. next? Yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Yes. So another part of yoga is obviously not just the physical. I think there's actually a much bigger part that's the philosophy of yoga and the mind kind of how to um, connect the mind spirit with the body and how important that is. Can you tell us a little bit more about that part? And, you know, I'm I'm specifically thinking about um you know, how, how we are holding, you know, experiences and tensions in the body and why yoga can be so helpful to work through things that are, that we're dealing with in our, you know, day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So all of our thoughts get stored in the body if they're not released into the world somehow, whether that be through movement or through conversation. Um, those are probably the two easiest vehicles to help unload our thoughts um, mm -hmm. is by moving our bodies and speaking our truth. And yoga allows you to move your body. So when we think about stress and we think about people getting overwhelmed and anxious and the nervous system becoming overactive, it's usually because you don't have a positive outlet to release some of these things that are weighing you down, mm -hmm. um, your emotions, your thoughts, your sensations. And we also have very sedentary lives in the United States, most of us. Um, I know on days when I'm forced to sit for long periods of time, my body hurts. And I always think, gosh, people who are at their computers and at their desks from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., no wonder it hurts so badly for them to try to move their bodies because mm -hmm. their body is used to sitting. And through the movement and the practice of yoga, we start to connect the mind and the body through the breath. 
And as we find that place of unity and union, um, things become more clear and less cluttered and we're able to make better decisions, um, be more focused, have more energy. And those are the benefits of a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Makes me want to do yoga. <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's it's interesting because I go through these phases where I do a lot of yoga and then in the summertime, I usually do a little bit less yoga and I find it, I, I find it easier to practice in like the colder months. So I really like yoga kind of now, September, um, all the way up until April, May. And then I feel like the summer just gets so busy with other activities. Um, and I'm really craving it. And I think I am craving it really for both parts. I'm craving it for the physical, for the movement and for the realignment and the stretching part, of course, which is if you've ever done a yoga class, you know that it's not just about stretching, but a lot about strength as well. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'm really craving it for that physical, for the for the psychological part almost, or for that spiritual part, because I think what one of the beauties and you know, there are so many amazing yoga teachers out there. And I hope that when you're listening to this podcast right now, you will, you know, maybe take a look at some of the classes that are offered in the area that you live in. Because usually, you know, good yoga teachers talk about, you know, a specific topic for the class or a specific focus of the class. And I think that is the power of, of yoga as well versus maybe any other exercise. Because, when you, for example, go for a run, right? You just go for a run and you you might even do that kind of unconsciously, right? You just run and you might still have a lot of thoughts on your mind. But I think yoga and the right teacher always brings you back to, to a specific thought or to a specific idea um, that will help you to, to work through certain things and observe better um, what is coming up in your body. And I've experienced it many times myself, you know, being in a yoga class and starting to cry because things got released um, physically. And I've, I know a lot of friends as well that, that share the same experience. Um, yeah. But, uh, what is your experience with all of that, Roberta? I, I think the more that we can do to bring our awareness to different aspects of ourselves and how we relate to the world are important. So when I teach, I now have a theme every month and for September it's patience and positivity. Mm -hmm. And every time I teach a class, our intention is around being patient and positive with ourselves and others mm -hmm. so that you can take what you experience on your mat into your life. And mm -hmm. for me, my yoga practice is a metaphor for how I am in the world. When frustration cr comes up, for example, however I respond to it on the mat, will be similar to how I respond to it in the world. And by creating that awareness on my mat and changing my relationship to being maybe less reactive, a little bit more open, a little bit more patient, practicing that just for an hour gives me the tools to then become aware of it in, in life with my mm -hmm. family, with my relationships, with my job. So if I I'm seeing impatience on my mat. It's probably also showing up somewhere else in my life. If I'm exploring the possibility of being more patient on my mat, it gives me the skill set to be more patient in life. Yeah. So they really reflect each other beautifully. Yeah, totally. Oh, I love it so much. And so after you started this yoga practice in college, um, how did you dive deeper into all things yoga? So I, I took that one college class and then throughout college, I continued to take other classes with the same teacher, but off campus. And I graduated from college and I got pregnant pretty, I got married right after I graduated. And then two years later, I had my first baby. So during my pregnancy, I explored yoga on my own, just mm -hmm. moving however felt good. And I really worked through my whole pregnancy to be mindful and I wanted to have a natural childbirth. And I feel like I was able to do that through my practice, mm -hmm. just my self-guided practice. Um, at that time, it wasn't easy to find prenatal yoga classes like it is today. Mm -hmm. And then after I had my baby, my um, husband was sent to California. So we started moving around quite a bit 
And this was in 1998 that my first son was born. And we moved to Great Falls, Montana, which was not an epicenter for yoga. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I did find one small yoga studio and continued to take classes there. And went through a really short weekend training during that time that we lived in Montana. I don't even remember what I learned. It was... <laughs> <laughs> It was just, you know, a very small introduction to yoga, but it gave me enough courage to try to start teaching yoga at the Air Force Base. And all I needed was some type of a certification. But when I first approached them, they said, nobody wants to do yoga here at the Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching step aerobics classes instead <laughs> and just kept asking and asking. And finally, they said, okay you can give it a try. And I think I started off with three students. And then by the time we moved away, which is about a year and a half later, I had 25 students regularly wow. coming, Amazing. which was wonderful. And yeah. then I moved to Santa Barbara, California. So you're in Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. I, I actually lived 50 miles north of Santa Barbara near Santa Maria, if you're okay. familiar with the area. I've, I've heard it. Yeah. And so I did my big 200 hour training at Santa Barbara Yoga Center during the time that we lived there. And that's when I just really dove in and fell in love. And then I took my first yin yoga workshop with Sarah Powers during that time and went on my very first silent yoga retreat with her mm -hmm. and her husband in the mountains of Santa Barbara, which was earth shattering and amazing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if you've ever been on a silent retreat you probably I have understand. not but okay. I really really want to yeah it's on yes. my list I really want to do a vipassana is a yoga silent retreat different than a vipassana so we did some vipassana um Sarah Powers is a Tibetan Buddhist and we did a combination of yin yoga vinyasa and vipassana meditation okay so yes so just to clarify here, when people are listening, they're like, what are they talking about right now? <laughs> <laughs> so when you're going on the Vipassana, it's a silent retreat. It's usually 10 days long, I think. And you really do not speak at all during these 10 days. It's supposed to be really an internal reflection. I think you're also not allowed to read. You're not allowed to journal. You're not allowed to do anything. You're just sitting with your thoughts which I think maybe that's why I haven't done it yet because I, I am okay with sitting with my thoughts, but I usually love to journal about it. So the, the idea of not being able to do that is a little scary to me. Um, so the reason why I asked Roberta if it is like Vipassana is because I don't think during Vipassana you do any kind of exercise either. I think you just you just meditate, I think, and you maybe can go on walks and things like that. Yes. Yeah, so right. we had, and this was only a four-day retreat, so it mm -hmm. wasn't a complete Vipassana immersion. Um, but every day we woke up, we had meditation, then breakfast, and then we did uh, 90 minutes of yin yoga, 90 minutes mm -hmm. of vinyasa, and then again, meditation and then lunch. And then we had open time where we could take walks or do whatever. Mm -hmm. And we were able to meet with Sarah during those hours one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation about some of the mm -hmm. things that we were experiencing, which was mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. So that was the schedule. And then um, we would do another short yoga class or meditation, have dinner, and then to bed around 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. amazing um okay sorry so you were you were in Santa Barbara and um, you did your first yoga teacher training and then what happened so then we moved to Colorado in 2005 and I I really completed all of my yoga training in California because mm -hmm. after that retreat it inspired me to do the 200 hour yin yoga training mm -hmm. and that was a 10 day immersive training in Napa Valley, California. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and that was um, my, I was trying to think my youngest was almost two years old when I did mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it, it was um, a long 10 days, but a wonderful 10 days mm -hmm. at the same time. I had never mm -hmm. been away from my children for that long. And once I moved to Colorado, I 
I taught yoga for a bit, but I also found that in Colorado, most of what was available nearby me was in fitness centers mm -hmm. and teaching yoga in fitness centers was different than teaching yoga at air force bases because a fitness center mentality you probably know mm -hmm. as a personal trainer yeah. is everything needs to be harder, faster, better, stronger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes>. And <laughs> my style of teaching where I really feel my gift is, is in helping people find those more softer elements of themselves to relax, mm -hmm. to get quiet, to be still. And it never felt like it matched up with my personality. Like I was feeling forced to teach in a manner that didn't really resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011, I had the opportunity to go through a Pilates training because I was managing the yoga program. And then they also needed me to manage the Pilates program. And I had never taken a Pilates class. So the gym where I was working, they put me through my level one Pilates training, and that mm -hmm. was perfect for me. I almost had to set my yoga practice aside for the time that I went through Pilates, because even though they're both mind-body practices, um, to me, Pilates definitely is more of that type A concentrated, focused movement for a purpose, where mm -hmm. yoga for me is the ability to move and breathe and connect and restore. So I put yoga aside when I went through my Pilates training for about two years, and then I started to marry the two together. And mm. that's how I came to where I am today. Wow, beautiful. And you call your um, yoga peaceful? Peaceful mm -hmm. Living, Living is the name of my company. Mm -hmm. And I teach yin yoga, gentle yoga, meditation. I do short Zen breaks, which are two to five minute meditations, as well as uh, divine sleep yoga nidra. So I got certified in divine sleep yoga nidra the January before COVID. And then also I teach Pilates mat classes. And in the studio, I have all of the Pilates equipment. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so if people are listening right now and they are like, mm, I don't know if I'm still sold on the whole yoga thing. <laughs> And what are maybe some Zen practices that they can draw from a yoga practice without maybe practicing yoga or going to a yoga studio? Sure. So the yoga nidra is a great way to get that Zen and that relaxation. Uh, yoga nidra, really, you just lie down, get comfortable and listen. It's like being a child and being read to you you do nothing. So that would be one way. Taking walks in nature and really being mindful. So leaving your AirPods behind, mm -hmm. leaving your Spotify behind, and just being with nature, being with the sounds around you. I love to take walks uh, towards the end of the day. I call it the golden hour where the sun starts to set. And by the end of the walk, you've seen so many variations of color in the sky I get so much peace from that myself. Um, taking a lunch break away from your computer, sitting in the grass when the weather is nice or snuggling up with a cup of tea in the afternoon if you live in colder climates. Finding things that bring you that feeling of nurturing and comfort and just being with your breath. The breath mm -hmm. really is the vehicle to lead you to the present moment and to lead you to a more peaceful way of being. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It all resonates so deeply with me. Um, yoga Nidra, I'm going to say a few words to this <laughs> again, because it's also, it's such a powerful practice. And as I was, when I was still in corporate, that was probably um, one of the most powerful practices I did during that time as I was feeling super stressed out and anxious. Um, I did a lot of yoga nidra, especially to help me to go to sleep in the evening because I had a really hard time to disconnect from work. And there are so many, you know, yoga nidra meditations and recordings out there. I don't know if you have anything, Roberta. I do. Um, great. Tell I, us about that. I have that. a lot on my on-demand library. So as I said before, every month I have a theme. So mm -hmm. I have patient and positive. That's a guided meditation in October. That will be courage and compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, we do abundant blessings in November. 
And then my favorite ones that I've written are my December ones. Um, I am a gift and it really just mm -hmm. um, has you call up your personal gifts, mm -hmm. um, the things inside of you that make you a special human being and to celebrate those at a time of year where we're in the spirit of giving. How can mm -hmm. we give part of our gifts to the world mm -hmm. during that time? Wow, I love that. So nice. Yeah. So you're going to try really highly encourage you to try that out if you have never heard about it before. And then the breath has been something I think we talk a lot about. I think as high achievers, we oftentimes think oh, it needs to be this complex, um, complicated solution in order for it to, to help us, right? Because if it's simple, then we don't really do it, right? And I see this all the time and, you know, I'm obviously considering myself a high achiever and I'm considering myself an A-type personality. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it took me a long time to kind of understand these tools and understand how powerful they are and how much of a difference they actually make when you start practicing them daily. You know that I practice journaling, for example, daily, which is something super important for me. Um, but also the breath, honestly, just recently has become really important for me again obviously it's always there and we we just take it completely for granted but I've been going through an episode of like more I've had like some issues with my tooth and I had I had a um uh just, just like a cold while I was traveling and I feel like my immune system has a little bit more down and I think then you start to become more might be fearful sometimes of you know the things that your body is doing and you wonder if you're going to get sick again and so I've been really trying to focus more on the breath and I I always observe that when I am in this fear moment or in this thought of fear or or worry that I'm holding my breath um, and it's so powerful so if you want to just start observing that that's such a powerful step to do as well because Literally just taking three mindful breaths can make the difference between feeling super tight and anxious um, and maybe even hurtful or or feeling a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, I'd love to guide you really fast. And yes, you, please. I have a breathing exercise <clears throat> called the birthday candle breath. And it's perfect for these moments that you were just, des just mm -hmm. describing of anxiousness, worry, the mind kind of spiraling and out of control. So I'll guide you and you can okay. try this and your listeners can try it when they listen. So yes. And disclaimer to the listeners, if you're listening to this podcast in the car, <laughs> <laughs> yes. maybe don't, maybe either, you know, uh, pull over and, and take a few minutes, but not, don't please do it. Usually during driving is pretty yes. dangerous. Yes. And now so, I for Close the minutes. birthday candle breath, just take a nice big inhale and then make an O with your lips as though you were blowing out birthday candles and just kind of blow that breath all the way out. And when it's empty, just take another big deep inhale and then make that O shape and slowly blow those candles out like you're blowing them out in slow motion. Empty out every last drop of breath and then do that one more time. A nice big inhale and make that O shape and just blow the candles out slowly, slowly, slowly until you're completely empty. And then let your natural breath return and follow it with your attention. And notice how you feel. What did you think of that? <laughs> I love it. I've actually never heard about the birthday candle breath. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of made it up. But yeah, that little O pursing of the mm -hmm. lips and just mm -hmm. really depleting every last drop of breath. Then you yeah. have to take another deep inhale, right? Because your lungs mm -hmm. are empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so powerful. I love to do that. Thank you so much for guiding us into that. That was really nice. You're welcome. So, you know, what kind of people do you actually work with? Do you do more classes or do you do also what we call nowadays yoga therapy, where you also do like one-to-one -one more like um, conversational Yes, I Headings? do all of the above. So okay. I have live stream classes every week. And I also work one on one, both on Zoom and in person with people. And they can choose 
really a variety of yoga, meditation, Pilates, and oftentimes we'll create that together based on mm -hmm. the needs of their body, the needs of their lifestyle. Um, creating self-care practices is really how we approach it at the beginning. What's missing, what's needed, and then how can we start to fill in those places to keep a person healthy and well and able to do all of the things that they love to do. Mm -hmm. um, so the one-on-one, -on -one, I can create personal plans for people and give them recommendations from my on-demand library. Many of the people that I work with are working from home or working in offices. So they love the flexibility of me saying, these are the things to do this week. And then they plug them into their calendars. Other people just regularly see me at the same time every week. So I can do as much or as little as a person needs or wants and mm -hmm. personalize that experience based on somebody's lifestyle and their well-being and what they're looking for in their life. Mm -hmm. And Amazing. yeah, I just wrote a program called Authenticity and Leadership, and I'll be mm -hmm. partnering with the Leadership Project to offer this training so that um, people who are in a corporate setting and looking to bring more empathy, authenticity, self-awareness to their leadership roles, I'll be teaching them ways to explore how they can do that for themselves so that they can take it into their workplace. Wow. Amazing. I love that. I'm also really curious because you were saying you have a lot of people that you work with that, that are working in an office and they work remotely. How do you approach a person that is feeling burned out? Burnout usually occurs when you're overscheduling yourself and your expectations are too high. So the first thing that I encourage them to do is to set healthy boundaries and those boundaries are going to be based on what they know is best for them. Mm -hmm. And then I support them in helping them remind themselves that those boundaries are in place because setting the boundaries is the first step, but then yeah. honoring your boundaries and standing up for yourself and advocating for yourself. Those are not tools and skills that most of us have. We just kind of go with the flow We let other people um, decide how our time is spent and how we go about each day. And then at some point, we're just exhausted and burnt out. So setting boundaries, holding your boundaries. And I always ask people to create some white space in their calendar. Mm -hmm. And if their calendar is cluttered, they're going to feel cluttered and burnt out. So uh -huh. where can you put in some white space, even if it's just 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one time a day, and then schedule nothing, like do whatever mm -hmm. you want when that time shows up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now people might wonder, what does that have to do with yoga? Well, in yoga, we <laughs> practice being mindful and aware. And mm -hmm. there's no way to be mindful and aware when everything is crowded and cluttered. So mm. if your life is crowded and cluttered and there's no space, there's no way to be mindful, aware, or present mm -hmm. for yourself or for the people that you're working for, working with, for the relationships in your life, for all of the things. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said that. It's so it's such a powerful reminder. And If you feel like you don't have, you know, all of the tools available to manage your calendar and to create boundaries and all these different things, that's obviously something that I teach as well. And then I would say as well, even if the first step that you take is signing up once a week for a one hour yoga class somewhere, um, or if you feel like it's not able, you know, you're not able to do that in person, you know, go, for example, on Roberta's library and check it out because there are so many um, resources available and that can sometimes feel really overwhelming which is why you know I want to offer you these two options um, to just start somewhere right because I think we oftentimes have have in our minds oh yeah I need to do this or yeah I've been wanting to do this for a long time but we're not taking action um, and that's holding us in this pattern as well of feeling overwhelmed and feeling stressed out and if you really really want things to change in your life you really 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 need to start taking action because otherwise nothing will ever change. I agree and You know, when people think about creating time for themselves, an hour might feel like too much. Mm -hmm. And with my library, the longest class is 45 minutes. 
And I did that on purpose. So you can do anywhere from two minutes to 45 minutes Mm. and have it work into your life so that you don't feel like you're having to completely reschedule things. Um, I call it planting little seeds. So even if you just take a two minute break, a five minute break, a couple of times throughout the day, try an online class. If you don't want to walk through the doors of a studio, gain some confidence there are so many things on YouTube right now too, where you can just pull up some yoga stretches on my Instagram. I do a wellness Wednesday segment every Wednesday, nice. and those are usually two minutes long and I'll show stretches that you can do on the floor at your desk. So, so many resources are Great. available yeah, if you yeah. start to look around. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great. Um, so it's national yoga awareness month. Um, yeah. What does that mean for you? I think it falls at the perfect time of year, specifically for what you just said. It's the end of summer. We're moving into a new season. The season is going more inward rather than outward. This Mm -hmm. is the perfect time to start thinking about how you want to spend the next few months. And as we move into the fall, the fall is a time of change and it's a time of quieting down and being more still and restoring your energy for the future. So I think September is the perfect time to do that with a yoga practice. Yeah, I think so too. And what a perfect day today on the fall equinox <laughs> yes. to record the podcast as well. So yeah, yes. so I'm really excited to share this with my community And how can people find out more about you, Roberta? So they can visit my website, peacefulliving.com, and full has two L's. I'm also on Instagram, Roberta underscore peaceful living. I'm on LinkedIn, Roberta dash Hughes. And I'm on Facebook as well. I always forget my Facebook handle because I don't use it as often. And they can set up a discovery call if they just want to have a conversation about Mm -hmm. uh, what they're already doing or what those first steps might be to gain the confidence to try a yoga class and know what's good for their bodies. I would love to do that. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I am so pleased that we had you on the podcast today. So thank you so much for your time and your energy and for sharing your gift with us. I think um, yoga is really something... That has helped me so tremendously over the last few years in my own personal development and that I always go back to when I'm going, especially through the more difficult times, um, because there are so many different tools available from yoga. It's not just the yoga practice itself. And yeah, I think I wish, you know, more people would would try it out. I've honestly refrained from talking too much about yoga and meditation in my business for a very long time because I always wanted to make sure that people feel inclusive of my offering. And, you know, I work with a lot of corporate people that might not be as open to mindfulness or to yoga and meditation. Um, But honestly, I think there's a, there's a movement even in that space where people are more aware of the importance of mindfulness. I just talked to a VP of a 350,000 people organization yesterday And he told me that he is practicing mindfulness and meditation because he has such a hard time to disconnect from work in the evening and he has not too many hours at night to sleep. And I was really impressed and I thought it's it's so wonderful to see that even these, you know, typical white male, you know, leaders that, you know, I think we oftentimes put in a box as well, also can surprise us in different ways. So... So if you're listening today and hopefully it inspired you to um, maybe check out a yoga class, then we've done our job today, I would say. So um, thank you again for listening. And if you know anyone that might benefit from the information that we share today, don't hesitate to send them the podcast and share it with them because that's the best gift that you can give to those people as well to just create and build their awareness. So thank you so much for doing that. And yeah, thank you again, Roberta, for being here today. And I wish you a really wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Julia.